Yeah, so we're going to talk about tools today. I've got a whole bunch of tools to my side here um, that I'm just going to pull up and show to you as uh, as we as we need to. Um, but I want to talk about a few of the things that have already been discussed in chat. Um, one of them uh, is the question that, you know, the first one everybody asks, and I've got to answer it right away, which is, what is your favorite manifold? Uh, my current favorite manifold is the SM380V from Fieldpiece. Um, I will be frank with you, I did not like the first uh, generation of the S-Man manifolds. We had some issues with them, uh, with them leaking and the hooks breaking off of them. And uh, I didn't like the fact that, I, I, you know, I've never been a big fan of micron gauge inside of the manifold. Not that there's anything wrong with having an additional micron gauge inside the manifold, but it's just not the right place to measure it. So when that first came out, uh, Initially, I, I valued it because I didn't, I was kind of on the edge of learning all this that we've learned about vacuum. Uh, but then once I found out that it didn't really work, then I kind of threw that manifold by the wayside. And I've used the Testo 500 for many years, or it's not 500, Testo 550 for many years. And uh, that's a good manifold. It's a, it's a good solid manifold. I don't like the software very much on it uh, personally, but it is a good solid uh, manifold that I've used for a long time and I still have one on my truck. But now that I've used the SM380V because it works with MeasureQuick, uh, I'm a big MeasureQuick loyalist, as many of you know. I think it's the future of you know, really being able to see deeply into the equipment. Um, that is my favorite manifold right now. But then the question is, why do you need a manifold? So that's sort of the next question. Um, quickly, Jeremy says, I like the 380 over the 480. Yes, because I don't have any use for four, uh, four port manifolds. Um, because I'm not pulling a vacuum through the manifold, so I don't want to spend money for an additional port that I don't have any purpose for. I mean, I guess you could argue that you could use it for recovery, but even then with recovery, um, we're moving to using separate recovery hoses as well and recovery rigs where we're pulling through 3 8 flare dryers and all that. So we're really going to a separate um, refrigerant charging and testing rig where we're using probes. Then we're using the digital readout on our... Uh, recovery machines, two recovery machines that I like best are NAVAC and Fieldpiece, and that is that they are both sponsors on the podcast, but I'm telling you honestly, those are my two favorite recovery machines. The MR45 um, from uh, Fieldpiece is great. We tested it when it first came out, and then uh, the NAVAC uh, recovery machine, and all of a sudden my mind is going blank on the exact model number, but there's a couple different models of NAVAC as well. Um, and we've got a caller, so uh, how's it going? Or is that Caleb? It might be Caleb. Anyway, fair enough. We'll move on. I think it was. I think it's one of my admins in there. Um, but yeah, we're really we're really good, uh, really big fans of using probes, and the reason is is that you have less loss. Um, one little thing that I wanted to show you right off the bat, because I've got my whole probe kit here, my whole field piece bag, which I like this as a bag anyway. It's just a really nice. It's a really nice uh, and effective tool for that. I'm gonna check and make sure my live stream is okay right now. Uh, it's giving me errors, but I don't know. We're just gonna forge on. Um, I like the bag because I can fit a lot of extra things in it. And one of the things, I think it's still in here. I don't know if I pulled it out or not, but one of the things I really like is the core depressors. Um, a couple different brands make them. I like the uh, AccuTools core depressor. Let me see if I've got one in here. Yeah, I do. This little guy right here. Um, this is great for the liquid side. And, you know, if you're using probes, it's not that big of a deal, especially if you have the core depressors adjusted just right. But on the liquid side, it's really nice to put this on first, and then you can basically open and close the liquid as you want. And then when you're done, you're taking this off with it fully undepressed. Um, especially for newer techs who just don't like the refrigerant spraying on their fingers. But regardless, you know, it does reduce losses. So uh, on the suction side, I'm not worried about it because you have so little losses. And another little trick is adjusting your core depressors so that way they're level with the seal pretty much. I mean, if anything, maybe extend it a little bit past it. Um, when you adjust those core depressors so they're the right depth, you get less losses so that it's compressing the um, the seal in it at the same moment that it uh, depresses the Schrader. And I, when I see a lot of guys get a lot of blowback, it's usually because they have uh, either their seals are messed up or their core depressor is too far out. And so it's pushing in the core too early before the seal engages. Pretty obvious, but it's something I see a lot. Um, but these core depressors are really cool. CND makes one. 
Um, this one is the AccuTools version, which is probably a little bit nicer than the ones you can most of the ones you get from CND. I think there's some other brands that make them as well, but I really like these, and I find a lot of I find a lot of use for these for several things. The one being, like I said, on the liquid side, you can have full control over your liquid line, um, so that way you don't get as much of that blow by, you don't get as much of that loss. But then also, we had a question in the group today about the CoreMax cores, and I think I might have one of those in here. I'm not sure. I, I was carrying one around for my classes. I don't think I do. I should have been prepared with that. But uh, but anyway, Cormax cores are those bigger cores that you see in a lot of commercial units. And uh, I've got my little adapter for the for the uh, 5 16 ports as well for mini splits in here. But um, when you have a Cormax core, you can't pull them out easily. I mean, you can get a $400 tool from JB to pull them out, but it's just not practical. Um I mean, I shouldn't say it's not practical. You can get it if you're working on a lot of them, but generally it's it's not going to be practical. So when you're pulling a vacuum, you're not going to be able to pull the cores, and that's where you would just use a core depressor because those Cormax cores, they open really wide. They're not quite like a typical Schrader, so they open with a lot more internal volume, so you'll still be able to pull through them pretty well. Uh, or some people just end up replacing the Cormaxes with a, t a traditional Schrader, but the whole reason for them is that you can get refrigerant in and out more quickly than typical Schraders without the need to pull them. Um, or you can uh, evacuate. Again, it's not still not as good as having the Schraders pulled, but if you use a core depressor, you can still push down on it pretty well and get it nice and wide open for an evacuation. Point being that um, if you're using uh, big vacuum hoses that don't have core depressors, you really need to have some of these on your truck because some cores you're not going to be able to get out. Um, we've all run into that at times, and you need, a, you need it for that, and cases where you've got core max and you can't get those out either. So... Those are a few things I wanted to talk about right off the top, but we use these, um, this kit, the, the job link kit. Um, and I always forget the exact model number of it, but it's easy to find. Uh, it's the full job link kit with the, with the rapid rail, uh, clamps and the probes, and then the induct, uh, psychrometers as well, um, from field piece. It's a really great kit of what's in this kit. Um, I love the probes. I love the 45 on them. They're really smooth. I love the rapid rails. This index psychrometers, uh, personally, just so I don't sound too much like a fanboy, I actually prefer the um, UEI index psychrometers for our market because they're a smaller probe and they work better in duckboard. We have a lot of duckboard. Um, and so I prefer them for that. They're, these are actually great for sticking to a vent. Um, and because they have the flexible wand, they're a little bit more... Um, a little bit more flexible and easier to use, but they just have a bigger tip. And so that's the reason why I prefer UEI when it comes to the index psychrometers. Um, some people will you know, swear by the Testos. I've tested those as well. They have very good sensors. All of those are pretty good psychrometers compared to what's been out there previously in the marketplace. And they have a lot of utility, not just for measuring um, total system capacity, you know, your enthalpy split across your evaporator coil, but it also gives you the ability to, you know, set a charge by superheat properly. It gives you a chance to measure indoor relative humidity accurately, you know, things that you should have always been doing anyway, or I, should, I shouldn't say you, we all should have been doing anyway. They give you uh, an opportunity to do that. So that's one of my favorite kits there for a lot of, a lot of different reasons. Um, so let's see, we had a, we had a couple things come up. Uh, one person said, um, uh, that they raised in a liquid port for Cormax. Yeah. Um, let's see here. I, I had a question here that I, that I saw, um, Testo 557 is a four port. Yes. And that's, again, I just haven't had any use for four ports. Now I will say one thing I like about the 557 to give the Testo 557 it's due is that it has a separate um, micron gauge that then it can attach at the system where the micron gauge is supposed to go. So that's actually one advantage is versus having an internal micron gauge, which again, I'm not saying there's no use for an internal micron gauge. It just, you're going to have to have a separate one at the equipment in order to get a really good look at what the vacuum is. Because for those of you who maybe haven't heard me talk about this ad nauseum, your vacuum at the gauge or at the pump is vastly different than what it is on the other side of the system, you know, uh, all the way where you actually care about where it is. So just because you hit 500 at your pump or 500 at your manifold doesn't mean you have 500 microns at your system. Um, let's see here. One of the questions was about the battery-powered vacuum pump, I think. I, I, I remember seeing that here. Um, I have used the battery-powered vacuum pump from, from NAVAC. I think it's a really nice 
uh, tool. I would I would probably still have a secondary pump. But honestly, if I had, especially the four CFM battery powered, if that was the only one on the truck, I'd feel fine about it other than just making sure I had an extra battery. Um, that always worries me with battery powered, but it's a great pump. I mean, it's really well made. The thing's built like a tank. Um, it's really comp compact. It's well balanced. It's just a really nice tool. It's a well built tool. Uh, so I, I do like it and I, I find it to be a really nice idea, uh, especially if you're going to be hauling vacuum pumps to tough spots. Um, just makes it, it's just a nice light compact tool and it works very nicely. The two CFM works fine too. Again, you're just not going to use it on really large equipment, obviously with it being two CFM, but for systems that are under five tons and under two CFM pump with large hoses is going to work just fine. Um, so that's, that's something that I would definitely encourage you look at. Um, especially if you're a tool nerd and you want things that are battery powered just cause, right? Um, all right, so a couple other things. Again, any questions, anything that you want to add into the conversation, um, you can call You can call in. You can uh, add your comments uh, in chat. Um, but I'm just going to keep going through the things that I wanted to talk about. One of the um, – and I've talked about this tool recently, and I want your opinion on this because um, I just always hated uh, people who <laughs> – I shouldn't say – I've always hated using cigarette lighters to light, and it seems like – I can never find my striker half the time, um, and when I do have it, it's like I always struggle with it, and I know I'm sounding like a baby here, but um, but I really like this. Uh, this is made by uh, Clip Light, which I guess is part of Diversitech now, um, and it's just – it's basically like a grill lighter, so it creates – I don't know if you can see that, but it creates a – yeah, you can see that. It looks kind of cool. It creates a little arc, and it's just very nice and easy to light, very reliable, especially when it's windy or wet or that sort of thing. Um so this is a tool that I picked up recently that I like, and a lot of the guys have been getting and have said they've enjoyed it. I think it's one of those things that, like, for somebody who's really experienced with torches, you're so used to doing it one way. But I think especially for the newer tech um, who's maybe a little timid with their striker or struggles with it, um, this is a this is a nice uh, little, little tool. Um, another thing that I got recently, um, I've been – I've been wanting to find a good uh, – insulated screwdriver that isn't an entire insulated screwdriver set like I don't we don't need insulated screwdrivers that often in what we do um, but on occasion you're going to be working on something so for example you may be working on a breaker that's off inside a panel now in certain segments of the industry you never do this with us we're licensed electricians as well and we also work in a market where we're allowed to work on some things. And so it's, I'm not advocating that you work on live, uh, equipment. You know, I know none of us would ever do that, of course. Um, but working near things that are live, I really like this insulated screwdriver from Klein. Uh, I just picked up a couple of these and it's, it's nice. It's got a, it's got a weird release to it. So normally you would expect it just to pull in and out, but you actually have to turn it and then it pops out and it's got a, uh, just kind of a standard size, uh, Phillips and flat blade on the other side. And, uh, and I like it quite a bit. It's insulated all the way down to the tip, um, which is just nice from a safety standpoint. Uh, so for those of you who are in the market for an insulated screwdriver, there's some really nice brands out there. Um, you know, Weha and Weera and whatever they all are. Uh, but again, I just, I don't, I don't use them that, I don't use an insulated screwdriver for that much and I don't really want an entire set. Um, somebody asked what the uh, model number is. I think it's just uh, INS Multi. I don't know if you can see that. I am insulated multi. That's that's all it says on it. So I don't know if you can get this on True Tech or not. I think that it says uh, thirteen four twenty one is the model number. This is very new to me. Um, I've only had this for a few weeks, but I've handed it out to a few guys, and they all like the idea at least. I mean, so long as it lasts. But I mean, again, it's just one of those tools you don't use all the time. Uh, if we were electricians then maybe we would you know again it's klein so it's a good it's a good tool um but maybe you'd get a separate set but but for us i think this is a nice tool um so let's let's get into a let's get into a debate quickly so you you all are uh, i'm sensing that you're maybe a little bored by this so we're going to go straight into a debate so how many of you use the guy um, well i guess it's my right i don't know probably your left here this guy here versus this guy here so we've got our impact, which I'll give you my opinion on it in a second. So we've got our impact, or we've got our driver. And in this one, I'm using the, the smaller battery. So impact or driver, what do you all prefer? 
because I'm going to give you my opinion in a second. Uh, Joe says he uses the screwdriver. And frankly, I'm a pretty big fan of uh, doing a lot of it by hand anyway. Now, again, impact versus driver. What are we mostly doing in our jobs? We're mostly removing 5 16 or quarter inch screws and putting them back in panels, right? That's that's mostly what we're doing. This is not the right tool for that. This is an impact, and I love it. This is, an, this is a fantastic tool. This little guy right here, this Milwaukee brushless, I love this tool. Um, I used it the other day to take a uh, a mower blade off, uh, or to you know tighten the the big old uh, uh, bolts on my. Uh, what what did I do? What did I adjust the other day? Oh, it was my uh, basketball hoop. It has these big old bolts on it, so I put the impact on there, and this thing's great for that. Taking a tire off, driving a screw into wood for building a deck. That's what an impact is good for, right? Because it makes these little impacts, all these little impacts all the time. But you take this and you use it on regular screws for panels, service panels, you're eventually going to strip them out. Now, if you're working in applications where you don't change, you're not pulling the screws in and out all the time. So typical residential, or maybe twice a year you're there. Okay, fine. But if you're, I see it all the time on commercial roof, rooftop units where they're serviced more often. People use these things, and the screws just don't last. A driver has an adjustment, so that way you don't overdrive. You know, just set this sucker on four, so that way you don't drive it in too far, and it's still pretty darn fast. It's lighter. I don't really like... I, so this battery's not right, because it doesn't actually sit with that battery. I would get the, get the wider one so it actually can stand up. Um, but, but this is the way to go. This is the way to go. Now, I hate to tell you that you're going to need probably three different drivers, but you guys don't mind buying extra tools anyway. Let's be real honest. You got your impact, which is great for some things, right? Like we talked about, hey, you're going to pull the head off of a semi-hermetic compressor. This impact is beautiful for that. Taking screws in and out, day in and day out, basic stuff that you do mostly. This is what a, dri a little driver like this is for. And then you're going to need a uh, hammer drill, you know, bigger, heavier duty type hammer drill type for, for if you're drilling holes into masonry, which occasionally we have to do. So some, so, um, some people say, well, you get a feel for it, you whatever. No, you don't get a feel for an impact. An impact, it just immediately, as soon as that thing starts going on you, it's, it's stripping out the screws. That's what it's doing. Now, before you all tell me that I'm being all high and mighty about it, look, I've used an impact on regular little screws for a huge portion of my career. Um, I've actually used a nut driver more often. I'm, I'm kind of a fan of using a nut driver, but if you're going to take, you know, 20 screws out of the top of a condenser, you know, thank you train, um, then you're definitely going to want to use a driver, but I'm just suggesting you use this one and not this one. So some of you have agreed. Some of you have argued with me. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of love for, for Milwaukee. Some people like DeWalt better. Look, Milwaukee, DeWalt, Makita, um, rigid, they're all good enough for what we do. If we were, if you were a, uh, you know, a carpenter and you were driving a bunch of screws every day, or you were using the saws all the time, that's where the grade matters. But frankly, Milwaukee, I'm sorry, Ryobi, I was going to say, I've used Ryobi most of my, most of my career. Ryobi is just fine for doing uh, service work. So for those of you who are service technicians out there talking about how DeWalt's better than Milwaukee, I mean, come on, they're both way better than what you ever need. They're, they're, they're great tools. Although I have been impressed with some things that, uh, that Makita has been uh, putting out lately. I've heard a lot of good things about Makita. I read consumer reports and all that sort of thing. So um, Chuck says that the Makita XST-01 is a sweet, gentle driver. Um, and hey, maybe, like I said, I've heard good things about Makita lately. So I wanted to get that out there quickly. Another thing that I wanted to mention while I was in the topic, um, before I get too far away from it, is that I, I talked a little bit about these line temperature clamps. Um, these use thermocouples, and they use a technology called rapid rail, where it actually conducts through the copper in order to measure the temperature. Um, but, but something to mention about that, uh, this is interfering with my green screen, so it sort of looks weird. But one thing to mention about that is, is it does rely on the copper being fairly clean. So if the, uh, if the copper gets uh, oxidized significantly or has anything on it, then this will start to read incorrectly. And a couple of people have shown that 
uh, one measured, you know, the same line, but sanded a portion and then didn't, uh, left a portion unsanded and measured with two clamps. If you measured separately, you would see that they would measure differently. You measure them together, they would measure the same. So that's something to watch for with these especially uh, because of the way that the technology works. Now, another nice thing is it does measure air temperature when it's closed because the loop is made, uh, the connection is made in the tip. So it will read, you know, just sort of your regular ambient temperature, not necessarily super accurately, but it will measure that. Um, but I wanted to show you an old favorite that I have. I don't know if any of you have seen this guy before. But this is the Cooper Atkins um, line temperature clamp. I don't even remember what the model is of it, but it's got the uh, probe thermometer that when you open it, it measures off the probe, and that when you keep it uh, closed, then it measures on a thermistor. And so it's a nice, accurate thermistor. Um, it's an expensive tool. It's it's about a hundred bucks for this guy, and the batteries go dead all the time. In fact, the batteries are dead on this one because it just has one of these little tiny watch batteries, which is one of the gripes I've always had. But I love this tool because sometimes you just want a line temperature measurement. You don't want to open up an app. You don't want to – you just like – for example, if you're walking through uh, you know, a rack house uh, in a grocery store and you just want to measure the discharge lines, you can quickly go through and just measure using this. Now, again, you can only open it that wide. So if they're any bigger than that, then it's not going to work anyway. Um, but this is a really nice – um, measuring tool. Uh, Kevin says that he's had nothing but issues with the field piece temp clamps. He said temp camps. I assume he meant clamps. I'd be interested in finding out more of that. We've we've had a lot of we've, we've had no issues with them in residential use, um, other than the fact that in certain cases, if it's uh, if the copper is oxidized. But I would be interested in finding out more about what what the, what's causing that or what's going on there. Um, because we've had a lot of really good luck, but I have heard some people have had issues with it. Kevin's in the grocery store. Um, side of the industry. Um, Oscar says that my clamps keep breaking. Which On which, Oscar? On these, your clamps keep breaking? And where is it breaking? Because I always want feedback on that. I'm, I, I talk to those folks a lot at Fieldpiece, and so I would want to know exactly what issues um, they're having. Um, Rich says they need to add a outdoor uh, temperature sensor, outdoor air temperature sensor. On the SM380V, it does have an outdoor air temperature sensor. Uh, it wouldn't be a bad idea to add something uh, in addition to maybe the line temperature clamps that just measure outdoor air. That probably would be a, a neat little feature if you could put it in a place that it's not interfered with. But outdoor air is always tricky anyway because you have to measure in a place that you're not getting interference um, from somewhere else. Uh, Bojan says the Testo clamps are good. Yeah, I've done a lot of work with the Testo clamps. They are good. The only challenge with the Testo clamps is, is that they use a round barrel thermistor. And I like the thermistor. It's a good quality sensor, but it doesn't connect that well to smaller lines. So it tends to be much more accurate on a suction line than it does a liquid line, just because of the way it's positioned in the clamp. If I had one here, I could show you, but it doesn't have a lot of surface contact to the line. And just the way it sits isn't, isn't quite right. Um, Joe says the Cooper Atkins strap thermistor like iManifold uses is the most accurate. And yeah, I've actually got an entire iManifold kit behind me here, and those are more accurate. They're just not quite as convenient. In a lot of cases, there's, there's a, uh, balance between convenience and, uh, and, uh, accuracy and longevity. I mean, you kind of have to balance all those things. Um, somebody was talking about bags. So let's talk about bags quickly. I didn't bring my, my veto bag in here. I've got two different bags, um, and I'm really bad at the veto uh, bag name, so forgive me. But I've got the full-size laptop bag uh, backpack, and I like that. I think if you're working in cases where you're going to be going up and down ladders a lot and you want to bring it with you and you need to use a laptop, I think that's probably the best bag for that. And then um, the, I have this small, like, electrical bag. It's the, um, it's the XL, the extra-large electrical bag. And I keep my, um, my Redfish meter in that as well as some basic electrical tools. That's sort of my kind of go-to bag. And that's generally because um, – uh, that's generally because most of the stuff that we're doing in residential requires, you know, your meter, uh, a nut driver – uh, maybe a uh, set of needle nose, maybe a, a set of wire strippers. You know, a lot of what we're doing is you know, checking capacitors, checking amperage, that sort of thing. Um, one thing that I would like to see, because I used to be a fan of the small field piece temperature clamp, which was not a super, um, not a super hardy clamp, but I just liked it because of its size. I picked this up, and I want to see what your thoughts are on this. I've tested it just on some basic stuff, and I've liked it. 
but this is just a little off brand. Let's see who makes it. It's called Unity. Um, it's a little off brand company. And the only reason I bought it is because I really like the form factor of it to go into uh, a, a, a basic diagnostic go bag. Um, and so I've been trying it out just to see, and, and I do like it. And now it is only a um, category two at 600 volts. Um, it's, it's not a, you know, it's not something I would probably trust my life on, especially if I was working in commercial industrial applications. Uh, but I, I do, I do like this and I'd be interested if any of you have exper have experimented with smaller form factor meters. Cause that's one complaint that I have with the redfish meter, uh, even though it's, it's, you know, one of my favorite meters as well as the new, uh, field piece meter is also a great meter, uh, because they do the power side, power quality, uh, measurements, wattage and power factor and, phase rotation and all that sort of thing, um, which, I, which I like a lot, but I don't like how big they are. And that is always kind of a, a complaint when you're trying to fit something in with other tools. Um, but again, you know, I, setting up a go bag, I think varies a lot depending on, depending on what part of the industry you're in, you know, what tools do you use most regularly? So for me, it would be a, uh, a meter. Um, again, I've got my refrigeration side bag, um, which anytime I'm going to be hooking up and checking uh, the refrigerant circuit, I'm going to be using this, which I already showed you. And um, I want to show you this because this is actually probably my favorite nut driver now. Um, you always need a nut driver, a go-to nut driver. And my beef with most nut drivers is that they're, they're thick all the way down to the end, and I don't like that. Sometimes it's hard to get into tight spots. And so I like this extended Klein nut driver as sort of my regular go-to um, six and one nut driver. I don't know if you can see that, but it's just got extended, uh, extended tip length. Um, actually, no, this isn't the one I pulled this one out because this one was actually a disappointment. There's one of these that has, yeah, that's, this is the one I don't like, um, because it's got the square drive on it. I'm not sure why it has that. Um, I had one of the extended ones that just had regular tips on it, but this one has the square drive on it, but Anyway, I, I do like having that that extended reach on the on the tips. Um, somebody also mentioned it just mentioned now the grinder for the win uh, on the Malco bits because that is uh, what some people are doing now is grinding down. And I don't know why they made them so thick because these are great bits, and I especially like this extended one. Uh, they also have the version that does 3 8 and 5 16 I think. Um, I think it's 3 8 and 5 16 But it's a really nice design, and it's got a nice strong magnet on it. Uh, but the complaint is, again, that you just have too much thickness here, and so it doesn't get into some tight spots. And so some people have been grinding it down in order to make it uh, more narrow, and then it, it fits a lot better. But again, that's a lot of extra work. So you have to have uh, Joe Shearer levels of obsession in order to make that, that that adjustment, I end up just getting frustrated with it. But I definitely like the design. I mean, that that flip design with the strong magnet is a really nice, really nice tool, and I do like this longer version of it. All right, I wanted to show you this. I've talked about some of this stuff previously. Um, actually, the answer to this, uh, Brian Meyer says, "Do your guys use the wireless for charging, or more for just quick checks?" We use it for charging. More and more of our technicians are going to using the field piece kit for everything. Um, our installers all have it because they're using it for commissioning. Uh, but service techs, there's still some who use manifolds. My son is one who uses the 380V uh, because he just is dead set that manifolds are better, uh, but whatever. Um, <laughs> Reagan says, move over to the left, Brian. The chat blocks your face when I watch YouTube on my TV. I don't know what to tell you about that, but being watched on TV just kind of creeps me out a little bit, honestly, Reagan. But uh, fair enough. Um, but yeah, we charge with the we charge with the wireless, and again, that's just because in this kit you have enough room that you can keep the um, the T's. I keep a couple extra little uh, lengths of hose in here, so that way you can get into some tight spots. Um, it, it's really quite easy, and then we just leave the charging hose on the tank. Um, with a ball valve uh, end on it, so that way we can meter at the ball valve. Um, this is another thing I really like, because I have always been a little irritated by the reach on some needle nose pliers, and I know that sounds really petty, uh, but I really like these. Um, these are made by Crescent, but there's a couple different brands that make them, um, and they've. it's just really nice because you can reach in 
and grab you know, a terminal or whatever you're wanting to grab at a distance without having the jaws get so wide, you know, you can still work because I just, I, there's just something about working at this, you know, this sort of, um, separation is so much easier to work with. And, uh, and I really like these for that. This is called the, um, X2 from, uh, Crescent and of the ones that I've tested, which I've tested a couple. I like, I like this one. Um, so anyway, um, Corey says he's been using the Appian charging tee to charge using the probes along with the ball valve, and it's been working well. Yeah, the Appian charging tee is, is a nice tee um, because it's just very easy to, to spin on and off. It doesn't bind uh, as, as some do. I've used a bunch of different types, um, and the Appian is a good one. And, and in fact, um, you guys know that I'm a big fan of uh, Bluevac. They're not a sponsor or anything. I just I'm a big fan of them. But uh, I really do like the Appian core remover tools still. I, th I still think they're probably uh, – th these and the Blue Vax are, are the two best core remover tools in the market as far as I'm concerned right now. Um, I, I will be honest. I haven't tried the Navax in as many um, settings as I have these. And I do like with the Navax that they have the 5 sixteenths and the quarter inch all in one. Um, but as far as just utility, using them day in and day out and not having them leak, especially under vacuum, um, I do like the uh, I do like the Appians and the Appian um, tees are also very nice. Oh, another little thing I forgot to show you in this bag here. I should I should have gone more through my bag. Um, I've got my I've got my Nylog in in my plastic bag in my bag too, because of course I put that on everything, much to um, Ralph Wolf's chagrin. Um, but definitely, if you're going to put Nylog in any bag, make sure to keep it in a plastic baggie because if this stuff gets into your bag, you're going to wish that it hadn't. Um, yeah, there's two other things in this in this little bag that I really like. One is my Yellow Jacket um, seal hook remover thingy, um, which is just nice because now you have those extra seals with you. The seals store inside here. I don't know if you can see that, but they, they store in there, and then it's got the hook. I'm about to lose my seals here. So it's got the hook that makes it really easy to replace the seals on your hoses. And I've seen guys try to use this and they botch it up because you've got to remove the quarter presser first. So if you're going to change the seal on something, like say you were going to change the seal on uh, this field piece, and I haven't tried to do this before, but you would pull the quarter presser out. And in some cases, they thread out, and in some cases, you just have to grab them with needle nose. I think on these, I think they thread out. So you take the back of this tool here, and you would put that on on the quarter presser and then just twist it out. And uh, and sometimes you can kind of twist them a little bit just to get them free, and then you just pull them out with needle nose. This one seems like it's just in with, with needle nose. And then you just yank it out, and then you take the seal out by twisting it out with a little hook. And I know, I know I'm being a little goofy here, but it's amazing how many guys don't do this and they end up leaving seals in way too long. Um, but I really like this. And then my favorite Klein tool of all is the AC, um, I forget what they call it. It's the 2, uh, 32613, 32613. Um, it's got the, it's got the nice twisting cap. It fits in the pocket. Um, you can actually, you know, it twists here too. So it gives you something to brace up against, but then... It's, uh, it's got the core remover on one side, and then it's got the uh, precision screwdriver on the other, and you can swap them around depending on whether or not you want to be working close like that or if you want to have a little bit longer reach like that. So you, they interchange either direction, um, either bit. So it just is kind of, a nice, kind of a nice design, and it kind of covers the main things that we would, we would need that for in our trade, which I like. Um, I think that's everything in this bag. I think I finally have covered everything significant in this bag. Got some caps and tees and all that sort of thing, but that's it. All right, where are we at here? Let's let's check the let's check the the questions again. Feel free to call in if you have anything you want to add that I'm missing or if I'm saying anything stupid. Um, I can just yammer on about tools all day long, so it's it's no problem. Um, let's see here. Yeah, dental pick works fine too. Um, some people have uh, said they just use a dental pick, and, and that does work fine. This is just purpose designed for it, and uh, and I always forget to buy dental picks, but a dental pick would also would also do the job. But the seals the seals fit nicely within this, which is just nice to have a few extra seals anyway. Um, 
So that is that. Let's see what else we got here. Oh, I know what I wanted to mention. We've got these, which I shared these a while back on Instagram, so you can find, because I don't remember the exact model that these are, but we got these on Amazon. And uh, I learned recently that even for brazing, that OSHA recommends a number three tint. And so, you know, as a technician, you probably don't care that much, but as a business owner, it's important to me that if there's something that could potentially uh, be hurting my employees' eyes, I wanted to make sure to provide these. So I bought a bunch of these, and I really like them um, because they've got these uh, side guards on them that kind of protect the sides of your eyes. But then they also, uh, they, they actually look pretty decent. I mean, not on me because I have a stupid-looking face, but... Um, they look pretty decent, and they're not very dark, and they're kind of a, uh, a yellowish color. And so it, when you're brazing, it actually kind of makes everything pop a little bit. And so a lot of our technicians have been really enjoying using these and um, have found them to be uh, have found them to be really good. So uh, that's just a, a quick thing that I learned recently is that you are supposed to be using a um, a, a three tent even while doing typical brazing. Um, one question that we get a lot, uh, Matthew asked, what are our thoughts on ultrasonic leak detectors? Um, ultrasonic leak detectors are interesting because uh, some people swear by them, um, but I've never had any use for them. Like I've tried them a bunch of times and I've never found a case where an ultrasonic does the job better than an electronic. And people have said, well, what about really noisy environment? You know, really noisy environments, obviously, um, if you can't hear your electronic, then your ultrasonic's also going to be a problem. Um, Bill says he has an ultrasonic, and for the most part, he likes it. Maybe I just haven't been patient enough. A lot of people who like them really like them, um, but I've tried them on two or three different occasions, and I've just never, uh, I've never had any luck with them. So we use um, largely still the uh, the Bacharach, um H10 Pro, and now the new uh, we're, we're trying out the new Stratus. Um, the Inficon Stratus, uh, because it has a good reputation in certain parts of the industry. Um, some people swear by the, what is the one that, um, uh, that Jeremy Smith always talks about that he likes? That's escaping me. Um, but there's a couple out there that people, uh, that people definitely like. Uh, Dizzy Dallas is asking for the sunglass link. I don't have it on me right now. If you look back on Instagram, you know, two weeks ago, uh, it'll be on there. And, uh, and I do give a link, uh, at some point on Instagram or Facebook, but, um, they they are kind of distinctive. Um, you'll find them pretty easily if you search, um, three tint, number three tint brazing glasses. Uh, again, you can tell I don't have any relationship with these people, but it's also an American company too. Um, so it, it seemed like they're well-made. Uh, Joe asked if he can have Tony's pair of glasses. Tony would probably give them to you if you asked him. Um, for those of you who don't know Tony McKay, he is one of the nicest people out there. Oh, and he says that he doesn't have a pair yet. They're actually sitting in the, uh, we, I took a whole stack of them and sat them in the residential, uh, training room. So a lot of the commercial guys, which Tony is a commercial guy, probably didn't see them, but, uh, they are, they are very nice. Um, all right, what was next? Um, next thing was. Nipex, um, and, and if you haven't, if you haven't seen, woo, all of a sudden I lost my, uh, lost my focus there. Give me a second, Let's see if I can get it back. There we go. If you haven't seen Nipex, then you've been hiding under a rock because all of the, um, uh, all the cool kids on Instagram have been using these uh, Nipex pliers. They have the Cobra end ones as well. Um, I like these. And I've got a, I've got three different sets of them. I got the kind of big, medium, small, and honestly, I mean, are they really that much different than uh, than a crescent wrench? Not really, but it gives you the ability to kind of do that motion where you you grip and then you open up and then you grip. You know, you're kind of doing this sort of a sort of a motion, which does make it a little more efficient. Um, so I've, I found that I do, I do like them. And the other thing that I like about them, I mean, it's, it's not like it's this huge rage, like I couldn't live without them. But the other thing that I like is that if you're gripping the edge of sheet metal, um, you can use these to kind of grip the edge and, and bend down or up or whatever um, without damaging it. So I do kind of like that as well. Um, 
again, well made. Obviously, they're expensive, uh, so I think it's one of those things that there are maybe is a little too much hype on them. But uh, but anyway, I do like them. So I've tried those out. Uh, let's see here. I'm not pronouncing Nipex correctly. What did I say? I said, is it Knipex? How do you say it? I don't know. How do you say it? Nipex. Nipex. Is it Nipex? Kunipex. Kunipex. Okay. Kunipex. There's always... Um, there's always some way that you pronounce it. I, this is a German company, and uh, my friend does high-end cars. He has a channel called uh, Obsessed Garage, and there's this, uh, there's all these funny names for things. Like, for example, it's not Porsche. It's Porsche. And if you say Porsche, it's like you're out. You're not one of the cool kids. So I think Germans like to say things weird just to just to keep us uh, guessing would be, would, you know, it seems like that's the case. It's sort of a highbrow thing. So I'll, I'm still just going to call it Nipex because that's what it looks like to me. Um, and, I have, and I'm uncultured, clearly. Here's a tool that I'm interested in because um, a lot of technicians don't know what it is. And I have found it to be exceptionally helpful through the years um, for a lot of different applications. I don't know why my camera's having a hard time there. Um, this is a tone generator, or some people call it a toner, or a um, some some other term that people use for it. But um, but there's a bunch of different brands that make these. In fact, I've seen this. This is now says Fluke, but I saw it under several different brands previously uh, in the past. And uh, it's a really simple device. You just have two clamps. Um, you would cr clamp it on two different wires. They, they say to clamp one to ground and one to a conductor within a cable bundle. But I've always just taken one on each wire. So, for example, if I'm trying to trace a low-voltage wire, I just take two of the conductors within that bundle, disconnect them, and just connect uh, to those spare wires. And then you turn on the tone generator. And I'm just going to show you how this works because it's really simple. And uh, it'll start flashing. And now when I hold the button, I don't know if you can hear that. When you get close to the conductors that it's connected to, it'll make that noise. And so for chasing out um, a, a conductor in a bundle, for tracing out a particular unit uh, attached to a particular controller, even if you're, if you're really struggling with that, um, you can always use this, and it makes it really easy. Even even tracing out a particular circuit within a panel, a de-energized circuit within a panel, um, you can do it easily with this. So I've found a lot of utilities for this over the years. The first thing that I used it for actually was in new construction when the drywallers would bury the thermostat wires and you had to locate them uh, within a wall. Um, it says short the leads and the tone will change. Yeah, that's another that's another factor. Actually, let's see let's see if it does on this one. I haven't tried it on this one yet. Let's see. We'll do it just for fun. Hey, there it goes. It's hard to... Yeah, you can hear it now. Yeah, so every time you, every time you short them, then the tone changes. That's kind of cool. Anyway, not that it really matters. Anyway, I've spent too much time on that. But tone generator. Uh, actually, the reason why I thought about this recently was because um, somebody had talked to me about an invention that they had made that was basically a convoluted way of doing what this does. And I said, well, have you used a tone generator? And they didn't know what it was. And so they had come up with this whole separate invention. And I won't go into what it was because I probably shouldn't do that anyway. But... Uh, but it was basically just to do what a tone generator does. And I think a lot of AC technicians don't know that this exists because it's more in the uh, telecom industries, mostly where you use these. And uh, it's just a nice tool to have on the truck. They're not that expensive. I think this one is 60 bucks, something like that, maybe a little more um, in that range. But you can get them for as inexpensively as like 30 bucks, um, and it's, it's handy. So there's that. Next one is the... Uh, the Fluke, uh, sorry, Klein um, non-contact uh, voltage sensor detector um, that has the built-in infrared 
thermometer. Um, I'm going to try to put the laser right in your eyes so that way you, I don't know, I don't know how that works. There we go. Oh, yeah. Um, and the main reason I like this is because I don't have a lot of use for infrared thermometers anyway, um, just because they generally aren't accurate for most of the measurements we need to take. But sometimes um, they are handy to see if you have a hot spot in a breaker or something like that. And again, the, the ideal way to do that would be with a thermal imaging camera. Um, but an infrared actually is kind of kind of handy to have and using it along with non-contact voltage, I think makes the most sense for us. So I've found that I've used this infrared thermometer more often than I have um, uh, other types of infrared thermometers. Um, and then non-contact voltage on this is nice. It's just simple. So you just hit the button, light goes blue. When you get close to an energized circuit, then uh, the light goes red and it's pretty, pretty simple. So um, not, not a, not definitely not the highest quality of either non-contact voltage or infrared, but relatively inexpensive and, uh, and nice to keep in kind of your go bag. Um, it's going off now. Shut off. Okay. All right. Let's see what questions we have here. Uh, did I sign an NDA? Yes, I did sign an NDA, which is why I didn't go into it at all. Um, let's see. What other questions we have here? Um, oh, somebody said uh, Brazing Shade Edge Eyewear SW11-IR3. Uh, somebody said that is the model number for that. So you can look that up, and uh, and hopefully that will be what you're looking for there. Um, uh, Rocky Mountain HVCR said the thermometer kind of sucks. Yeah, I mean, you know, um, infrared thermometers all kind of suck for most of what we do. They just, you, you have this emissivity factor and everybody's basically just picking a number and the emissivities of different surfaces vary quite a bit. And then you also have um, the the spread and I forget what they call that, but it's the um, the area that it's measuring. And so the further you get away, just because you see that little dot, you think it's measuring at that dot, it's actually measuring a much wider, a much wider range. Um, if you wanted to really do it accurately, then that's where a thermal imaging camera is great. And if you start, you know, get a FLIR one, um, that, that is a much better tool for that. And it gives you a lot more um, functions and, and features. I wouldn't spend a lot of money on an expensive infrared thermometer. Um, I just don't think generally there's going to be a lot of utility for it. Getting a good quality thermal imaging camera may be something that's worth it, uh, especially if you're, you know, trying to locate, you know, line sets behind walls. And if you're trying to, um, again, look at an electrical panel and spot which breakers are getting hot or hot spots, or you're wanting to compare one motor to another motor to see if it's running hot or seeing if you have, um, you know, bearing wear, those sorts of things. Um, some people have asked whether you can use uh, these regular infrared thermometers like we have and use them for uh, for measuring your temperature um, with this whole COVID thing. And no, you, you generally cannot because they don't have the accuracy within a tight range. So the ones that are used for people, they're really only looking for this very small bandwidth. And so they are very accurate within that bandwidth. The ones that we use are measuring a much wider range. And so they just don't have that fine accuracy. And you can tell because if you try to measure your skin temperature with a regular infrared thermometer, it's not going to be anywhere close to um, to correct in most cases. Because again, there's that whole emissivity factor. If you have one that has adjustable emissivity and you can set it to the emissivity of your skin, now you're going to get a lot closer, um, but just not, not practical there. Um, all right, let's see what else we've got. Um, all right, so we're going to go, I'm going to go to my next tool um, that I've already talked about a few times online, but I do like it. And in fact, Bill Spohn has requested that I do a review of this tool. And so I'm just going to do it now on video, and then I can share this with him. Um, so this is the Temtop M2000C. It's probably one of my more requested things that people ask how I like it, uh, because it's a handheld um, IQ monitor. So it measures um, PM2.5, and CO2 as well as temperature. I'm going to go ahead and put it on the mode so that I can show you. It has this mode called all information. And uh, so it measures PM 2.5 and PM 2.5 is small particles. Um, it measures PM 10, which you can see is the second one down. That's a larger particles. And then it also measures um, CO2, but the CO2, it has to preheat. So it takes it a while for it to preheat the sensor and then it starts giving you a CO2 readout. 
uh, and then it gives you temperature and humidity. And what I found is, is that I've tested it against um, uh, at least three different uh, kind of consumer grade particle counters. I've used the laser egg, which is kind of now my winner. It's my favorite consumer grade particle counter out there. I've used it against the um, uh, Air, I Air IQ or IQ Air, what is it? Air IQ. Um, which is has a great reputation. I've used tested it against the Fubot, and I've also tested it against. Um, they have another version of this called the M10, and I've tested against all of those. And um, uh, the PM2.5 and the CO2 in this measure very closely with those other consumer grade. I mean, you know, within. 10%, 10%, 15% within that range, pretty accurately across all the range that I've observed at my house. Now, that's always a question because my house doesn't have these wild ranges of PM2.5, PM10, and CO2. So I can't say that it reads accurately on the edges, and I can't say that it measures accurately on a wide range of different humidities because generally I'm measuring between 45% and 60% relative humidity when I'm testing it. So the point being that I've been happy with it. If you want to look at particle counts in a house and you want to look at CO2 levels in a home, um, then I feel really good about this tool. I think it's a tool you take and you set on the counter. You can come back and see, do they have an abnormal amount of particles in their house? Is their CO2 level exceptionally high? That's all I would use it for. And then once you make a change, you can go back and you can see um, you know, where you stand on, on CO2. Uh, Joe is laughing because he says wearing masks and measuring CO2 because when you wear a mask, you're uh, exhaling into your mask and then you're rebreathing in a certain amount of CO2, and that is true. Um, Ken asked, what is the name of this device? This is the Temtop M2000C. Temtop M2000C. You may be able to get it at True Tech Tool Tools here shortly. They're vetting it right now. Um, I've had it and given it out to the technicians now because I feel good about using it. Um, it it's not perfect, but generally pretty good tool for measuring particles and CO2. Some people are going to ask, uh, how accurate is it on the humidity and temperature? And my answer to that would be not accurate at all. I've measured it against, you know, my testo tools, my field piece tools, and it's kind of all over the place. So sometimes it seems to get lucky and be close. But like right now, it's showing 62% relative humidity in my office. It is not 62% relative humidity in my office. So I'm not... Uh, I'm not, uh, not going to trust it for humidity and temperature. Um, now, the longer you let it sit still, uh, the more it seems to kind of uh, you know, be a little bit closer. Um, I'm not sure if it's picking up off of my hand or what it is, because, again, that's the challenge with the handheld device um, is that it does tend to be more interfered with by the user. Uh, but anyway, it's, it's a very inexpensive device compared to things like, you know, Fluke makes particle counters that are in the thousands of dollars. This is a very uh, reasonably priced device. And I think for technicians who, you know, want to at least have some idea or customers who want to have at least some idea of, you know, what's in my air and is it within an acceptable range, this gives you the ability to do it. And as you can see, my PM 2.5 is 3.4, which is well below where you would start to get worried. Um, anything above uh, 12 uh, PM 2.5 um, micrograms per meter, uh, that's where you start to uh, get, you know, where you would say the air is maybe getting a little bit uh, dirty, but when you're below 10, you would consider that to be uh, pretty darn clean air. And then as far as CO2 goes, you can see I've been in here breathing, so I'm just under 1,000. Uh, outdoor CO2 levels are in that sort of 400 range, um, and so it is It is getting high. When you get above 1,000, that's when people start to... Uh, start to want to bring in more outdoor air. And that's how you, that's what you do for high CO2 levels. You just bring in more outdoor air to help deal with it. You're not going to reduce CO2 um, by any other means other than by bringing in outdoor air. Um, Oscar says, why does Brian have that Donald Trump tan today? Uh, I've been, I've been outside a little bit more. I did some work out in the yard. I also played golf twice in the last 10 days, which is a lot for me. Um, so yes, I, I am a little bit red, uh, a little bit on the orange side. I'm a pretty white person in general. So when I go outside, I tend to go from orange to red and it doesn't get much better than that. So, uh, so yeah, that's what you're, that's what you're noticing is that, that and the bright lights in my face. So, all right. Any other questions about any tools, any callers, feel free to call in. Uh, if you've got any questions, I'm going to look through the chat here real quick and make sure that I'm not missing anything. Um, and, uh, and then we're going to call it a day, so...
let's see here. I'm going to actually bring up chat on the screen, so that way you can all see it if you have anything that you want to add here. Uh, let's see here. All right, so let's see what we got. Oh, a couple people are saying that they uh, that they like the background. Okay, well that's why I just got rid of it. If you were liking it too much, so I just uh, so I just got rid of it. Um, Central Air says, "What type of respirator mask do you recommend?" Um, depends on what type of job you're doing. So if you are going to be working in places where there's a lot of chemicals and uh, dust in that PM two point five or worse area, then I would suggest that you use. I think they call it a um, an N one thousand type of mask. It's that kind of full face mask um, type of thing, and uh, and those work good for that. Um, a lot of people are still using N95s, um, or they call them the uh, KN95s, which is the Chinese standard. There's a lot of those still out there. Um, I've got I've got a couple of those, um, and then just those kind of regular paint respirators um, are used for day in and day out stuff. If you're you know working under a trailer or something like that, or in, an, in a dusty attic, um, if you're really working in a place that you're really concerned, then that's where you would wear those big uh, full face ones. And I think those are called the N1000, if I remember correctly. Um, let's see here. Uh, what would be your recommendations for the best way to uh, use the psychrometer on the field piece smart probe? Um, so positioning is important. Um, let's see. Let me make sure that I, I'm understanding correctly. But yeah, positioning is important. You want to definitely always use them on a mixed airstream. Uh, and you want to make sure that um, they're not going to be interfered with. So you never want to put psychrometers or any sort of air probe in line of sight from heat strips or a heat exchanger or anything that's going to be hot or a coil. You know, So you don't want to put a psychrometer directly above an evaporator coil. So in a gas furnace, that can be a challenge. Um, some people will prefer to put them on a, the closest vent, and that's fine, but just recognize that's not going to be exactly correct because if you put it at a vent, you need to put it very close to the vent or almost up into the vent because as soon as it leaves the vent, that's entraining other air from around, and also it's going to have picked up um, some um, uh, it's going to pick up some temperature within the duct itself. So positioning is really important. Uh, if you can put it in the duct, but a little bit away from the equipment, or put it at the closest vent, kind of into the vent when you're measuring on that side of things. Um, Bill said how to use psychrometers in refrigeration. I mean, I don't know that there's a whole lot of utility for using psychrometers in refrigeration. You could use them to see what the humidity is within a box potentially, but just keep in mind that whenever on all these psychrometers, when you get to the edges of the range, they start to get pretty inaccurate. So when you're measuring in between, you know, 30% relative humidity and 90% relative humidity, they're pretty accurate. But when you start to get above 90 or down in those lower ranges, um, especially below 20 and below 10, whatever, they start to get pretty inaccurate. And that's across the board, as far as I'm aware, on the consumer grade, the types that we're typically using. Um, yes. I know, Ken. I always say Ken's name wrong. So I'm just going to start calling him Kenny C. And it'll be like Kenny G, um, but a little bit more different. So yeah, let's bring let's bring Ken on. Hey, Ken. How's it going, buddy? I, you know, I'm just happy that somebody called. Because I was starting to think that there's something wrong with me. You know, I've got 200 people here watching and nobody wants to talk to me, which hurts my feelings, frankly. So uh, how's, how's things going with you? Yeah, we did. Yeah, I really buzzed through them. For every tool, um, I like comparison. I like field testing. How do you feel about redundancy? Yeah, so the question was redundancy. Sorry, I didn't have his audio on at first. Um, yeah, redundancy is uh, is big depending on the type of tool. So what are some examples of some of the tools that you would feel naked if you didn't have redundancy? So I like I I carry two sets of two complete sets of smart probes on my truck as well as a digital manifold and I still got my old four port manifolds. Um just in case something fails or I feel like it's not reading right, 
I like a backup. Same thing with my meter. It's it's really my the tools I rely on to do my job every single day. I personally like a backup just in case I'm doubting the accuracy or resolution. Yeah, and and I, I agree with you. I think it's one of those things that um, it's one of those things that. Some people are saying they can hear you and some can't, which is a little weird. Um, so I'm not going to worry about that. I'm just going to keep going. It's one of those things that um, it's not a bad idea to have redundancy. Uh, but there is a, a cost-benefit analysis you have to do at some point on whether or not it's worth it. I think always having a backup set of gauges is, is great. If you're on a budget, then I would say get a set of probes and then um, you know have a even an analog gauge set uh, with a line temperature uh clamp you know I, I love having this line temperature clamp because it gives me that extra redundancy and there are cases that i just want to have a little line temperature clamp um like like joe says it rather have it and not need it than need it and not have it and that is true um there just comes a point where i think all of our significant others get a little sick of us having so much redundancy but i think it really just depends on what it is things like your manifold your meter um those are things that are likely for you to have problems with and so I think that's big. Micron gauge is one that I like to have a backup, um, where traditionally people wouldn't have had backups. Um, backup hoses, backup seals, um, ports, adapters, um, screwdrivers, things that you just you can't really live without. I would always have I would always have backups. But I think you can definitely start to overdo it uh, where it stresses the budget. How does your How does your wife feel about you uh, about you having backups of everything? I think that's the bigger question. Um. <laughs> <laughs> it was frustrating for her at first, uh, me saying I wanted uh, a backup, backup of this or a backup of that. Uh, it's like my, uh, I've got the Testo 770-3. I've also got the IDVM 550. Um, it, it, she thought it was a little overkill, but uh, it, to me, I don't, I don't feel that way in the field, uh, in which she supports me in my career. Uh, thank. Thank God, because um, <laughs> without her, I wouldn't be where I'm at. Um, but I view it as necessary, and, and she supports me in every every way. Yeah, your wife is an accountant, right? Uh, yes, sir. That's correct. Yeah, yeah. So she's especially uh, probably watching out for that. So yeah, it sounds like you got a good one there. But but yeah, it is. It, it, it's always a it's a balance. Um, now I do want to ask you. You've you said you've got the Testo seven seventy dash three and uh, the redfish meter. So, which one of those do you like better? Oh, that's tough. Uh, so, because I am hooked on Measure Quick, uh, I'm going to say IDVM. Okay. Um, I do like the versatility of the 770 3. The fact that the retractable hook retracts back into the meter, I do like that. Uh, I can get some really tight spaces with it. Um, it was the first Bluetooth meter I purchased, so I got very comfortable with it very early on. So it's it's my quick go to. Yeah, I I have things I like about both of those meters, and I have things I don't like about both of those meters. And one of the things I don't like about the seven seventy dash three is that it tends to read a little bit high uh, in the low current measurement. So like when you're measuring on a condenser fan. Uh, if it's a high efficiency fan or it maybe draws under an amp, uh, a lot of cases you'll see that it measures a little bit on the high side. Have you run into that? Have you noticed that? I had not picked up on that, no. Okay. Um, and maybe I've yours is fine. I've tested a bunch of them, uh, but maybe yours is one of the ones that's okay because they've tested them a bunch of times and said they can never replicate it. But I had it, several of them that I went through, and they were all measuring uh, you know, two-tenths two, three tenths high, which shows up when you're measuring a condenser fans. And it also shows up when you're doing tests on, um, under load tests for capacitors. And so often when I was using that meter, I would, when I did the under load testing, um, I would find that it would measure like it was, you know, had higher capacitance than what it was rated for, which just doesn't, doesn't really happen in real life. So. I'm going to have to test that in the field. I have not tested them side by side. Uh, I carry, uh, but for my meters, I carry five completely different brands, uh, <laughs> and I've tested. I, I know you're going to call me crazy. Everybody always does. Um, I've compared 
uh, I have a fluke that is my go-to, and that's kind of my baseline right. that I'll compare my other meters to. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to go wrong with fluke. Um, yeah, and I, I've tested, like I said, I've tested against several different brands, and and uh, I like the fact that both of them are true power meters, and that's what I kind of use them for. Um, I think as a power meter, the Redfish is more capable, and because it works with Measure Quick, I like that a lot. Um, I've had a few little issues here and there with the Redfish meter, um, one of them being that it will go to zero when you're ohming things. And so if you're ohming something and it's in a really low ohm range, so under one ohm, it'll just say zero, which is a problem if you're ohming leg to leg on a compressor, especially if you're comparing uh, against the uh, the charts from Emerson, from the Copeland charts, or if you've got a newbie and they are looking for leg to leg shorts, which a lot of newbies do, and they see zero and they think, oh man, it's bad. And, uh, and I've had that happen on one occasion where somebody was using a redfish meter and because of that condemned a compressor that wasn't bad because it read zero ohms, which they should have known better. That wasn't the fault of the meter. Um, but that's one little complaint that I have. And, uh, and Jim's response to that was, well, look, they're not accurate when they get that low anyway. And I recognize that, but I just don't like it saying zero when it's not actually zero. It's just a personal preference thing. I don't know if you've noticed that at all. I, I have, but uh, I also carry, um, I, I have, uh, I'm to think of what brand it is, um, my Megometer. I think it's a field piece, if I'm not mistaken. Um, that's that's an issue I've noticed with the auto ranging on the uh, 770-3. A lot of times you'll get some weird readings off of it when it's trying to auto range for right. you. right. Uh, it can throw you off if you're not if you're not paying very close attention to it. Yep, yep. I've I've seen the exact same thing as well. Um, well, cool. Anything else? Anything else you want to talk about? No, that was it. I appreciate it. All right, man. Yeah, thanks for uh, thanks for calling in. Thanks for being the only one with the with the guts to call in. Good old good old Kenny C. Are you okay with me calling you Kenny C. instead of trying to pronounce your last name? Oh yeah, that's. That's great. No, the the last name throws a lot of people off, so I'm good with it. Okay. <laughs> All right, that's fine. And you can call me. Uh, you can call me what my kids call me. They just call me Bri Bri, uh, which is a little weird. Um, actually, don't call me that. Scratch that. Forget it. Uh, cool. I was gonna say I like Brian with an I. Uh, you know, a lot oh. of people. Uh, a lot of people throw that out there. So. Yeah. No, that's not okay either. Um, you're gonna have to. You're gonna have to go back to the well there. Um, cool. <laughs> Well, good talking to you, buddy. All right. Have a good night. You too. Um, somebody asked about uh, my take on the Supco 500. Um, and my take on it is that it's a good idea, but the problem is is that it shows scroll compressors as being bad when they're not bad. And so that's my beef with it. It's just that simple. Um, if, a, if a meter says bad on it, uh, which I don't like that it says that. I would rather just give a reading because a lot of times um, technicians will connect leg to leg. When I say technicians, newer technicians, and they'll see it say bad, and they'll say, okay, it's bad, or they'll do it on a scroll, and a scroll will say bad when it's not bad. Um, Joe, Joe says you can't mega scroll. Um, you absolutely can mega scroll. You can do it. It just measures low. And some people will say that it damages the scroll, and I, to that I say hogwash. Um Copeland put out a bulletin on what type of measurements you'll get on a scroll. So why on earth would they put out what measurements you can get on a scroll if you can't, if you can't make it? Now they say they don't recommend you making it because they use a high pot. Um, but regardless, uh, I feel totally fine about making a scroll. It's just that you're going to measure low measurements on a scroll in a lot of cases. But Joe, if you want to argue with me about it, all you have to do is just pick up the phone and call the number that's on the screen. Uh, actually, the number's not on the screen anymore. So yeah, sorry about that. That uh, that kind of makes it confusing. Um, but yeah, feel free to feel free to call in. Let's see if I can make the no call in numbers block now. So just call in. I don't know what the number is anymore because I can't bring it up on the screen. All right. Uh, call in line is 914-205-5384. 914-205-5384. Write it down. It's the same every week. If you want to call in. That's the thing uh, for you to do. But anyway, um, I don't mind it if people who know how to use a Mager use one. 
Um, I use the cheap one that I bought on uh, Amazon. I don't remember the brand name. I did a video about it, and it works just fine, and I like it. Um, it's just because uh, Albert just asked that. What megometer do I use? And that is the one that I use. Um, I have a caller, and I'm going to guess that it might be Joe Shearer. So I'm just going to bring him on and see if it's Joe. Whoever it is, we'll be happy to talk to him. Um, hey, Brian. Hey. Hey, we've got Tony McKay on, and we got another caller. Let's get Tony McKay on next. Okay, put Tony on, and then and then you can talk to the other guy. I'm assuming it's a guy. It could be a lady. All right. All right. Could be. All right, hold on. Yo, Tony. Hey. What's going on? What's going on? Oh, you know, I'm just sitting here talking to oh, you. Well. <laughs> well. You know, I have been working in Tallahassee lately, so I almost qualify as Joe. Okay, fair enough. I'm not I'm not saying that I want to talk to Joe more than you. I'm just saying, you know, I, I figured he would be the one to call. But uh, what, what do you got going on in your life? Oh, not a whole lot. Um, I actually haven't tried the Stratus, but just wanted to, just had that thought pop in my mind, just that word, that detector <laughs> the, the, the word stratus just popped in your mind and you wanted to talk about it a little bit um so the only person at kalos actually that's not true there's two people at kalos who have the stratus one is my brother and i don't know if he's used it or not he was supposed to because bill spone sent it to him to test uh, but i haven't talked to him about it and the other person who has one is my son alex so far he has not been super impressed uh, on residential equipment, but I also don't know that he's using it correctly um, because it has several different modes in it. It has like a cloud mode and then it has like a pinpoint mode. Uh, the Stratus is a infrared um, leak detector, which always throws people off because you have to keep moving them around. Um, and so that's a, that's a gripe about it, but it has an actual display where it shows a readout of uh, parts per million refrigerant, and that's what a lot of people like about it. Plus, it, it's a very accurate sensor. So in theory, it should be um, as good, if not better, than the H10. Just a lot of people end up going back to the H10 just because it's sort of tried and true. Have you heard anything about it? Um, I think Daniel got one to borrow. Oh, did he? Okay. Anderson. Um, I did not know it was infrared. Yeah. I, to that totally throws me, but, I mean, I still trust it. Like you said, it has a good sensor, I guess. Well, um, so, so the, the Stratus was designed to compete head-to-head -head with the um, Bacharach PGM-IR. Are you familiar with the PGM-IR? Your video, sure, yes. Oh, okay, so you saw the video. All right, well, that's a cheat. Yeah, so the PGM-IR is an exceptionally expensive um, leak detector that's the size of a small suitcase. Um, and that was that leak detector was used in grocery refrigeration and you know lots of high end leak detection types of situations for a really long time. And the PGM IR is infrared. It's that's what the IR stands for. Um, and it's always recalibrating itself to a purified air sample. So it actually has a filter, <clears throat> uh, a pre filter, and so it actually is checking against a purified air sample to constantly recalibrate itself. And again, I don't understand everything about these sensor technologies. I just know that infrared requires this constant recalibration um, where heated diode does not, or heated diode, heated pentode, or whatever. And so most technicians prefer, at least the ones I know, prefer heated diode, heated pentode type technology because you can take it and put it on the same leak over and over, and it will always go off in the same way. Whereas with an infrared, you have to you have to be continuously moving it. But um, but yeah, I'd be interested in more people trying out the Stratus and letting me know what they think about it. Um, the grocery guys like it so far. I haven't heard anything bad about it from the grocery space. Um, but, you know, I don't know if it's going to, I still don't know if it's going to be practical for kind of the regular residential, like commercial um, types of situations. I just, I'm just not sure. Yeah, the, the field piece um, heated diode is the one, my favorite lately that I've been using and it seems to do a good job and i kind of had the infrared before the same field piece infrared and nothing bad just um yeah i just uh, the preference on the heated diode for sure yeah and we've tested a lot of people um 
talk smack about anything other than the H10 Pro, but we've tested the field piece, um, and I, I don't remember the actual model number, but the field piece heated diode, I tested the Testo heated diode, and they all did pretty well. I mean, you know, it's good quality leak detectors. Maybe not quite the accuracy of the sensor or maybe the serviceability of the H10, but the H10 is a big beast too. So, you know, there's something to be said for something that's a little more compact. So um, I'm going to bring, uh, I'm going to go ahead and bring Joe in now uh, because Joe's here. So Joe, how the heck are you, buddy? I'm great. How the heck are you? I'm, I'm great. I mean, I'm, fa I'm fabulous. You know, I got to text with you yeah. a little bit today and now you're here on my live oh, stream. Oh man, it was so much fun. It, it really, it really was. Um, so... You and cannot... people were thinking that, you know, you're intimidating, so I wanted to call and show the world that, uh -huh. you know, you're not that intimidating. No. You're really just a man, a mere mortal. With a chubby face, who... and, 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 and I look a little orange today, I've been told already, so there's really nothing to be concerned about. So I why it was a really nice complexion, <laughs> Did you... personally. Wow, okay, this is the getting lighting, a little deep now. It... Oh, I'm sorry. We'll save that for the texting. Yeah, right. we'll save that later. Um, so you were telling, you were saying that you cannot, and I, this is your quote: "You cannot make a scroll." So why can you not you're do it? Right. Physically, your megometer you, just you breaks when you go it. to make it. Yeah, it'll explode. Yeah, it could explode in your hand. Uh huh. Arc flash, you'll be blind for at least a couple minutes. It's not <laughs> recommended. <laughs> so. No, I. You're absolutely right. You can do it. I just meant, I, you know, sometimes I'm not the most articulate in my typing. I don't know if you've noticed that. But right. It's come up a time or six. <laughs> it's come up a time or two. Uh -huh. I just meant you can't get any, like, useful information from doing it. Um, I would say that it's not useful because, so l I, let's let's narrow this down. This is a good topic. It's a good topic. Probably could use its own podcast, so we won't go too far into this. But the reason I'm why not it's a not mega expert, I don't even own one because I don't even think they're very useful. But I, I find I them to be. To think I'm an expert. <laughs> I find them to be useful um, in particular use cases, and so let's let's um, let's use this example because we've all been here. Uh, maybe maybe you haven't, but I've been here plenty of times where you go and you're oming out the compressor to ground, and you're not picking up anything. You're not picking up anything useful. You know, you're reading maybe in the mega ohm scale, high mega ohm scale, but you don't, you're not picking up that dead short, but yet you know this thing has a dead short because you walked up on it and had a blown breaker. Um, what well, tends to, you, you've never, never had that ground, before? But yeah, I'm just saying, well, I would think, well, I guess it's not grounded. It's shorted. Well, no, no, it can be grounded. But, but what happens is... And not pick up... Yeah, because think uh -huh. about yeah, because think about what's going on with inside this compressor. All right, you have uh -huh. this compressor shorted and it's, it's grounded, but but it's a mess inside there. So when you have a grounded compressor, you've got burnt yeah. oil, you've got windings all over the place. I mean, you got this thing that that shorted out in this very unsanctimonious way, and carbon and all this stuff. Oh yeah, it's like the refrigeration apocalypse. It is. It's a, it's a dang refrigeration apocalypse in that compressor, and so now you take this meter with a 9-volt battery in it um, that really isn't, it's, it's not putting out high voltage. It's putting out, the ones I've measured, uh, it's putting out a few volts. Mm -hmm. um, and so you're expecting to, you're expecting those few volts to go out and based on uh, whatever, you know, whatever the overall current is that those, from those few volts, um, it's supposed to calculate what your ohm reading is. Well, it's not that accurate. That's what it comes down to. It's just not that accurate because your signal you're isn't right. that strong. You're right. And so by using a In higher fact, voltage... You're making me remember it. You were just making me remember a time when I couldn't find it to ground, turn the compress, you know, turn the power yeah, right. back on, it trips it again, read it again, and now you do see it. Sure, right. And you do see that because yeah, you just have exactly. this very dirty environment and you're using very low voltage. You know you're using low voltage because you can take the two things and put them on your dad burned tongue in ohm scale and it doesn't shock you, right? So you know that it's not using that high voltage. Well, try to do that same thing. <laughs> I, w I, would, I would definitely not recommend this. Try to do that same thing with a mega ohm meter and see what happens. You know, you'll get a nice, you'll get a, yeah. you'll get a nice wake up. So, um, so yeah, that, that's the reason why mega meter has a okay. purpose. Okay. Um, and it's not, I well, think people get obsessed about the reading. We, hold on. Go ahead. Hold Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, but can we can we say define what's usefulness? Because 
all right, let's say you've got a breaker tripping and mm-hmm. the compressor's cold mm-hmm. and you stick your mega on the scroll mm-hmm. and it says mm, bad, less than 20 mega ohms. Okay, well, some people I've seen it on YouTube, they condemn the compressor. And right. It, it they shouldn't do that. Have, it could have been a fan motor. It could have been a crankcase heater. Right. They shouldn't do you that. You know, so number one. Yeah. Which is, that's okay. So right, that's what so I don't like about the Subco. That's what I don't like about the Subco. Keep going. Right, 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 right. So let's go back to your example where you're saying you can't pick up anything to ground, but it's popping the breaker. You know, pretty quickly, just with the process of elimination, you you can decide, well, compressor's grounded, shorted something. Mm-hmm. It's a compressor. It's internal. It's not a crankcase heater. It's not the fan motor. It's something in the compressor. So, I, you know, I guess that's just why I don't have right. one because I've never thought of a use to where it's like make or break. The mega's going to give me the answer I need. Yeah, but I mean, again, yeah. that whole process of elimination, you and I, we call that around Kalos, we call that the redneck test. That's that's what we call it. Um, and that's just, you know, okay. bang, it tripped the well, breaker. A bunch of rednecks. Well, so, we, I mean, there are a few of us around there. Bang, it tripped the breaker, disconnect. <laughs> now you flip it and it doesn't trip the breaker. That's yep. the part that's bad. I mean, it's just that simple, right? But, but that isn't really the best right. practice, especially when you're dealing with a compressor. Uh, well, it's okay. it's not because I mean you know if you do it and now you have an arc flash and now it you know terminal vents um, or every time you do it you're introducing more crap in, inside that system because you are I mean every time you do that yeah. you are introducing an arc to the inside of the system so again I'm, I'm not I'm not saying that it's a bad practice because again I've done it a zillion times. Yeah. Um, I'm just saying that that is where I use a mega ohm meter now, and we have found it to be quite effective. And you just don't say at 20 mega ohms is bad. It's going to be much, much lower than that. I mean, it's going right. to be under one mega ohm um, if it really has it to ground short. A, a mega, a, a true mega ohm meter is going to pick that up. And, and you know, like I said, I I'm not, I don't own a mega, so possibly you've developed a way that it is useful for you, and that's wonderful. You know. Right. Um, but I guess I was just saying that because I've seen so many people, um, you know, hook that thing to a scroll and up oh, bad, up oh, bad compressor. Let's change it. It's like, well, wait a second, you know. All right. Well, I'm going to make you must start online. Warm up. What's that? Oh, am I still on the line? Yeah, you are. Did oh, you? I didn't know. I was just going to say I used to watch um, Eric Melly do some videos on using a fluke. Uh, mega ohm meter on some train big train units before can't remember exactly they were scrolls but well, there's a lot of things you can use and open winding motors i mean you can use mega ohm meters all the time and they work just great i mean you need to help identify which component you know if you have multiple motors you can go through and test them all to ground and figure out which one it is um, and again using that higher voltage now you don't want to use higher than you need to generally the rule is you use double the general applied voltage so if it's 200 you know 240 volt you'd use 500 volts um if it's 480 then you'd use a thousand if it's 120 you'd use 250 i think you get the point here um it's not like you want to go way too much but um you can go through and easily check and you're just using a lot more oomph than you are that's a technical term using a lot more oomph than you are with a nine volt battery that's dropping that down to even lower voltage uh, and a regular ohm meter, so that's that's all. Just as a stronger signal gives you a better um, gives you a better look at what's going on. Um, so, uh, Joe, I've got Diego on the line, and he's got a question. I'm going to let you answer it. How about that? Since you're here anyway. Oh, great. Okay, since you're smarter than me. This is. Hey, Diego, uh, how's it going, buddy? Good, good. Um, Brian, how about yourself? You know, I'm doing great. Where are you calling from? I'm calling from Elgin, Illinois. Illinois, great. Yeah, I, I'm, I don't know Illinois too well, but I know it's a lot colder than in Florida. Uh, I don't know Florida is the exact same thing very well, but I'm pretty sure it's a lot warmer over there. <laughs> Generally speaking, yeah. So uh, so what's your question today, Diego? Uh, I just had a question because uh, I'm barely like new to this trade. I'm barely had, like, I went to school for like about a year, and then I'm working in this uh, residential company right now for like two, almost two years. And uh, for pulling a vacuum, I was I was hearing it on the show that like you I, I don't know you you usually um don't use that four port uh like manifold. Mm-hmm. Which one do you recommend more like to use like just like because at school I remember we did like with the three uh with the three port manifold and then I was just um reading a couple 
uh, articles online, and you could do it also by just hooking up like your vacuum with a micron gauge. Which one do you prefer more? I'm gonna let I'm gonna let Joe take a stab at that. Joe, which one do I prefer more? <laughs> um, hi Diego. Let me give you the official HVA school answer. <laughs> You're gonna want to take that manifold and throw it as far as you can, <laughs> and never. <laughs> Never hook it up to do anything other than charge a unit. Or and check. I mean, you uh, could check it. I mean, you could check back. a charge, but probably not. Probably not even that, really, because you would prefer you use probes for okay. that. Okay. Oh, yeah. Well, you know what? I actually like manifolds at, like your son. I feel like maybe a little closer with your son than maybe some other people, because I love a manifold. <laughs> Personally, I own several of them. I don't have. But a uh, I do not use them for at all. You don't have a manifold on your truck. I think uh, that was Tony. Just wanted to throw that out there. <laughs> oh, okay. Sorry. I was like, wait a second. Okay. <laughs> but no, to answer Diego's question, yeah, you're definitely going to want to get a good quality uh, vacuum hose, like possibly the AccuTools uh, Blue Vac hose. And, um, you know, just use that dedicated for your vacuums. Remove the cores, uh, one hose or two. Probably the official HVAC school answer will be two hoses. And, no, 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 uh, no, 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 absolutely there. not. Diego oh, yeah. is one hose now. Okay. Yeah, Diego is new. Diego's new to this. Okay, so we're gonna say. Okay. <laughs> so, Did I fail? Yeah, you failed. So yeah, yeah absolutely, you're done now. Um, was, somebody asked me in uh, chat just now, which I'm thrown off by. Somebody just asked me whether or not I'm sitting on a five gallon bucket. I don't know what about how I'm sitting that makes me look like I'm on a five-gallon bucket, but no, I'm not. I'm sitting in a regular, weird desk chair, but thank you for asking. No, so to answer Diego's question... I can answer the... Uh... Sorry. No, go ahead. You, you, you can use one hose on the suction line and put your micron gauge straight to the liquid port on a residential, most residential equipment. Yes, so if you're going to be working on generally residential equipment, then I would get one big hose, pull your core from your suction line, hook your big hose to your vacuum pump, and put a micron gauge on the liquid line with a core depressor. Um, the video you should watch is, um, okay, it was done by me. I'm not going to lie. Uh, it's on YouTube. <laughs> it's about evacuation start to finish, and it shows how to use one large hose. It's much simpler, and for somebody who's just starting out, that's definitely the way that I would um, I would suggest starting, uh, especially if you're going to be doing uh, residential work. Is that the type of work you're going to be doing, Diego, is mostly residential? Yeah, mostly residential. Yeah, that'd be a good place to start. And it's the nice thing about it is it's not expensive um, to get a single hose set up and a core remover. Um, the micron gauge is going to be the most expensive thing you get, and so just get a good one and take good care of it. Clean the sensor with alcohol regularly. Um, and, uh, and it's a really simple way. You'll pull faster and deeper vacuums than anybody, you know, and, uh, and it'll last a long time with very little issues uh, compared to using a manifold, which again, I mean, you can pull a good vacuum with a manifold. It's just going to take you a lot longer. And it's going to be that first time that you're trying to get home on a Friday night, uh, and you're waiting hours to pull a deep vacuum that it's going to be really frustrating. Uh, a gauge just isn't an ideal way to pull a, pull a vacuum. Even though it's the way people have been doing it for years and years, we've learned a lot recently about this. Okay, I keep. Are you going to be I'm mostly? Mm -hmm. Are you going to be mostly pulling vacuums on brand new systems that you installed, or systems that you've worked on, repaired? No, probably like systems like uh, when like. We're fixing a leak or like changing an evaporator coil, things like that. Okay. Yeah, just don't, uh, you know, don't be concerned if it seems like it takes forever to get a low micron reading on systems that have been in operation um, when using either method, um, especially with a one hose method. If you're pulling on a system where you're, you know, if you're doing the entire system, like, the compressor, the condenser, the evaporator, the line set, everything. You might want to hook up two hoses, two core tool removers. Um, what Brian mentioned about the one hose method is really great when you're like doing an evaporator or doing a new install. But even uh, when you're doing a repair, it, it still seems to take forever to get below, you know, even 700 sometimes. So just want to let you kind of know that can happen 
Well, and the main thing there is yeah, is that I was reading if yeah, because I was reading like if you do uh, like you guys were saying, you pull like uh, with two holes, if you get like I think uh, a three eighths to the you hook it up uh, to your vacuum pump and then uh, that you put that on like on your suction side. And then you get another hose and hook it up to your uh, liquid line and hook, hook it up to a vacuum. You can pull it a little bit faster because you're using, like, the two-hose method versus, the, like, the one like you were saying right now. Yeah, but the one-hose method I'm saying is using a three-quarter-inch hose. This is a pretty deep topic. This is, like, a whole other podcast. Um, I would I would just suggest um, take the spend the twenty minutes watch the watch the full evacuation video on on our channel. It's right on the homepage uh, now. It's one of the first videos up there, and uh, watch that video because it explains the different ways. And it's totally fine to use two large three eighths hoses, something like that. That works okay, but there's just more connectors you have to have. Uh, and that's fine, but yeah, somebody said change your oil. Yeah, change your oil regularly. If you're going to be pulling on something that you that the compressor's already been in play, it's a good idea to do some nitrogen sweeps on it. Um, it just kind of helps create a little bit of turbulence and and get you pulled down quicker. Um, there's a lot to pulling good vacuum, but I think you're you're in the right. Uh, somebody didn't like my reference to nitrogen sweeping there. I don't think, but uh, but you're on the right path if you're asking these questions because these are these are good questions to be asking. And, and you'll experiment and find what works best for you. All righty. Well, I appreciate it, Brian, and all of you guys for all the info, too. Yep. Thank you so much. All right. So I'm going to uh, I'm going to go ahead now and uh, wrap this thing up because we're already almost half an hour long. And uh, it, what started off very slow with me just yakking about tools really turned into something as soon as uh, Joe and the others showed up. But it all started with – it all started with my good buddy Kenny C., so I've got to give Ken Case Beer, Case Buyer, Case, however you say his name, Kenny C, credit for being the first one to call in. So next week, you can call in 914-205-5384 and, uh, and talk to me because it's fun. So thanks, everybody. Appreciate you.